Hello, everybody. This is Gerald Salenti, and we have with us uh, a real man of men, uh, someone that's been on the other side, knows what it looks like, and a bunch of other sides, uh, former Colonel Douglas McGregor. And he was also the ambassador to Germany under the Trump administration. So this guy's been around, you've seen it. And he talks a lot about what in the world is going on, what's going to happen next on the military fronts. So thank you very much for being here today. Really appreciate it, Douglas. Sure, um, happy to be here. I, one quick correction, I was nominated to be the ambassador. I was never confirmed. Oh, so, you weren't confirmed, I didn't know that. Uh, All right. <laughs> Well, we'll confirm you in the name of the father and of his son. <laughs> well, that would be helpful. <laughs> you know, you know, I have to tell you, we, I, we before we went on the air, I said, you know, I'm heartbroken about what's going on in the world. I start crying when I see the slaughter of these Palestinians in front of everybody's eyes for all to see. And, and where's the outrage? Mm. And, and it's just going to keep escalating. And so, and then we have the Ukraine war going on. And one of the covers of our Trends Journal magazine, two days before Russia's military operation on February 22nd, 2022, we said from COVID war to Ukraine war to world war. I believe we're in world, world war three's begun. And it's just going to be a false flag event that makes it quote official. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about where's the Ukraine war going? Where's the Israel war going? And what can we do to, to, to help change this? Well, sure. I, I think uh, it's worth mentioning that last year we had uh, 112,000 Americans die of fentanyl poisoning. And we're not even beginning to address the numbers of Americans killed as a result of criminality of all types and kinds, the tens of thousands of children missing who come in through the border into the United States. These things don't get any attention. And uh, we see these bizarre policies of provoking greater warfare and conflict, both in Ukraine and the Middle East, go unchecked. And I think it's because you and I both know that Capitol Hill, Washington itself, is occupied territory. It's donor-occupied. Ralph Nader, it was a very solid guy, by the way. Today, it's his 90th birthday. I always liked Ralph. I didn't always agree with everything he said, but he's a man of pure heart, and, and he's pointed out for years, well, Washington's corporate occupied. I think it's more than that now. It's really donor occupied. We have lots and lots and lots of very wealthy people, billionaires, hedge fund managers of all kinds who pour money into these policies. The policies involve keeping the borders open. The policies involved not prosecuting and jailing criminals or more important, executing them. And then finally, prosecuting wars overseas in which the American people have no real interest whatsoever. The only real interest Americans have at this point to deal with a serious threat are the borders. We've got to, we've got to control our borders. We've got to secure them. We've got to secure our ports. We've got to check, take action to reverse the damage that's been done. I don't care how many illegals there are, and I'm sure there are at least 30 million. We have got to take action against these criminals and move them out of the country. We can't afford them. And if we go into the financial crisis that people like you and James Ricards and Alistair, Mac, uh, uh, Alistair McLeod and I think Nassim Taleb have been talking about for quite a while, and I think we are going to go into that and see terrible consequences for our misguided, deranged financial policies, how are we going to afford to hold things together? Are we going to simply feed the new arrivals and ignore the American people? That seems to be the policy in Washington, D.C. So the biggest problem we've got right now is we have no representative government. Yeah. We hear all about democracy, which is a sham, and our republic is in ruins. And in the meantime, everybody on the Hill is getting richer. That's about it, is it not? You nailed it. And you know, there's an article about the, the on the on the migrant crisis, explaining a, pan, a plan to give migrants debit cards. New York's program is bec uh, the idea seemed like a common sense solution with thousands of meals intended for migrants, uneaten and wasted. New York City leaders leaders little slime balls, little boys and girls of nothing. 
New York leaders created a pilot program to distribute debit cards to families. And, and they've, they've limited to $10,000 on the credit card to give to migrants. I mean, this, yeah, this is absurd. I'm sure there are lots of Americans out there having trouble putting food on the table that would love to have $10,000 to get through the next few months. I, you know, I'm not surprised by any of this. And, and frankly, we've already seen that the same people they want to give $10,000 away to and bus or, or fly all over the country are committing heinous crimes against American citizens. We're, yep. We only see a fraction of what actually happens. People don't report it. It's incomprehensible to me. But I guess, you know, we're, we still labor under the illusion that two things are, are happening that we still have a state where rights are protected and the police will enforce them and enforce the laws. We don't. And the other part of this is that we're going to have an election that will change something. <laughs> no one ever talks about in election integrity. The assumption is, oh, well, that's all right. We'll get through this and we'll win. Win what? Yeah. And who gets in there and who does what? You know, I, I, I've done this several times. I've referred to Oliver Cromwell's speech to parliament in 1657, where he stood up there and said, you know, you, you are a bunch of whoremongers, essentially cheats and thieves. And, uh, you know, in the name of God, go for all the good that you have done, go. And he, he shut down parliament, took over the country and ruled it. I think it was 1657, maybe an earlier, but the bottom line is I think we've reached that point. I don't know why anybody expects anything to change in November. Oh, it won't. You know, you called it before a donor occupied country and corporate occupied. You said you've gone to that once upon a time, there was this guy by the name of Benito Mussolini, a paisan of mine that I'm not very happy about. He called the merger of state and corporate powers fascism. That's his definition. The merger of state and corporate powers. And that's exactly what we have now. And it's not donor. It, this is the morons. It, it, again, it, you know, the, the stupid people call it campaign contributions. They're bribes and payoffs. Exactly. And well, that's all they do. I think it's worse than that. I think we're talking about a class today. I call it the ruling political class in Washington and in the rest of the country. They're all part of the same general class of individuals who are super wealthy and uh, super national people. They, they don't even view themselves necessarily as Americans because they spend all of their time flying around the world, staying in five-star hotels, celebrating their shameless wealth and the power that it exercises. So they have no roots anymore in the country where they might reside, whether wow. it's here or anywhere else. So this is a ruling class. I mean, I think it was Sam Huntington who talked about these people before he died. He said, this is a real danger to our civilization, that there is no longer a ruling class inside our country or anywhere in the West that cares about the West and the people that live in it. I mean, somebody asked me earlier today, he was listening to this man, Radek Zakorski, who is married to Ann Applebaum, and he's the new foreign minister in Poland. And he wants to go to war with Russia in the worst way, he wants to drag everybody into it with him. And he said, you know, why isn't this man listening to the Polish people who want nothing to do with a war against Russia? I said, well, the Polish people have no money. How can they pay him? He's already being bought and paid for by others who do have money. And I think that's what we see inside Washington. We see it yeah. in the professions. Everyone is being handsomely rewarding for going along with extremely destructive and dangerous policies at home and abroad. You mentioned about the, um, you know, the, the, the rich getting richer. And you have 1% of the population in America owns 54% of all the equity markets, 1%. When you put the 10% in, it's over 90%. So I call us nothing more than plantation workers of slave landia, because that's all this has become. And when you're looking at who's running the country, it could not be clear in front of everybody's eyes, because once upon a time when we were young guys, there were things called grocery stores, hardware stores, Mm. stationary stores, drug stores, and right. now they're all chains. Yeah. They own everything. Well, don't you think COVID finished off the small business people? 
Well, COVID did, but also how about killing the Robinson Patman Act, Sherman Antitrust Act, Clayton Antitrust Act, Glass Steagall Act? Well, you one, know, one after another. Wonders from why, little, from yeah, a little why clown Am boy. Yeah, you know, but wonders why Amazon and uh, Microsoft and others have not been broken up. Yeah. Smaller organizations. There's no interest in Washington in pursuing any of it because it doesn't pay. You know, people forget about Amazon, how it began. What they did, what that guy did, Bezos, is they started selling books very, very cheaply, much cheaper than in bookstores. Go back, again, this is the beginning of it. And all the bookstores, all the local bookstores started going bust. Mm -hmm. Amazon was losing money year after year after year, probably almost for 15 years. And all they kept doing was selling stuff cheaper and putting other people out of business. Right. And, and again, the big zone, everything now. And my greatest concern right now is that, again, it, it's, it's the nightmare going on in front of everybody's eyes. I, before I get there, there's, I see four things running America. The military industrial complex, the drug dealers that they call big pharma, big tech, and the banksters. That's pretty so he, good. Yeah, I think that's accurate. So here we are. The, you you were talking before about all the migrants coming in. Are you, oh, we got to, you, you can't stop the migrants from coming in, yet you're fighting these wars? Sure. And, who's getting, and then you heard Victoria Newland, the, the that that jerk who, again, this is in, in the Trends Journal going back, uh, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts wrote an article for us in 2014 how the United States overthrew the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych in Ukraine. She had just said that, well, even though we're spending sending this money to the military, you know, for Ukraine, the products are being manufactured in America. Yeah. Well, that's what uh, President Biden told everybody quite recently. It's all right. It doesn't make any difference how many people we kill overseas. How many countries are destroyed? How many societies are ruined? The important thing is it's uh, financially rewarding here in the United States, not for everybody, but for some of the, the individuals and the collection of people that you just described. And remember, the people at the top of these institutional groupings that you mentioned, they're all part of the same class. Yeah, That's the problem. I mean, it's like a, a Soviet nomenclatura for all intents and purposes for your viewers out there that remember that. And these people are completely disinterested in what happens at the bottom. Now, there's some good news. The good news is that uh, this can't go on too much longer financially or economically. You know, someone was talking about the Great Depression to me and said, oh, well, you know, we can come out of this. We came out of the Great Depression, even though we'll go into a bad recession early and be fine. I said, well, first of all, you got to remember that when we went into that depression, we had large quantities of gold, number one. We were demanding that all of our creditors pay us in gold. So we had a constant influx of gold. Secondly, we had a huge manufacturing base. It was simply a function of restarting it so that we could employ millions of people very quickly. Now, you tell me, what do we have today? What's out there? We only have, as far as I know, one continuously operating tank line. So if tanks are the products that we're making for export overseas to everybody, you're not going to have very many people on that assembly line. I mean, this is absurd. It's crazy. So what happens? What happens, I think, at some point will be what happened in 1789 in France. And that was when the Paris population suddenly discovered it couldn't afford to buy bread. It wasn't that there was no bread. There was bread. Population could no, no longer afford to buy it. So what happened? It's called revolution. And I expect something like that to happen. I don't know if it'll happen before or after the coming election, because maybe maybe people will wait to see whether or not anything changes in November. Good luck. I, I'm just very, very downcast. I just don't see evidence that we're going to see dramatic change. Do you? No. Again, how about off with their heads 2.0? <laughs> Well, I remember uh, listening to the rallies for President Trump when he was running in 2016, and virtually every rally that he attended, where thousands of people that showed up, they would start chanting, build the wall, build the wall, build the wall. 
And he was happy and smiling and said, yes, we're going to do it. What was his first priority when he came in? Obamacare? Obamacare. What happened to the wall? Well, not much. Certainly not where it counts. So, yeah, you know, I'm wondering what's going to happen this time around. Then there was the other chant. Every time he mentioned his opponent, Hillary Clinton, everybody started chanting, lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. Everyone expected a special prosecutor to be appointed. Well, there was one that eventually showed up, but it was going to go after him, not Hillary Clinton. So, <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm wondering, where are we going from here? And then you look at the people that surround the candidates and advise the candidates. They're, most of them, with a few exceptions, and there are a few, are giving the same kind of bad policy advice that was received the last time. So there we are. I, you know, we'll have to see when the American people will finally wake up and demand something change. And you're going back to Trump. The other, you promised three things, build a wall, give the corporations the tax breaks and yeah. build the, rebuild the infrastructure. He didn't build a wall. He didn't rebuild the infrastructure, but he gave them the tax breaks. Right. And in in 2018, he the bullet BS he sold for the big corporations was that they would invest this in capital improvements. Instead, of, by 2018, they had the biggest year of stock buybacks. Of course. So and that continues even now, as you know. We still have stock buybacks going on. We have this false sense of prosperity. People say, well, look at the gross domestic product. Keep asking, how much of it is government money? And they look at me strangely. It's at least a third or more. The other thing is about the following. Um, um, oh, by, by the way, when you're talking about, what is it, let them eat cake? Back in the, uh, did you hear the, the, the clown, the Kellogg clown that came out? The, the, no. the CEO of Kellogg? No. saying that people can't afford to buy dinner. They should be eating cereal for dinner. Oh, oh okay. Well, he's a worthy successor to Marie Antoinette. Perhaps yeah, he'll right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine this? So yeah. going back to the Great Recession, what followed the Great Recession? What The Great Depression? World War II. When all else fails, they take you to war. Well, I, I think I think there's a lot of truth in that. But, you know, the interesting thing is in Ukraine, uh, Vladimir Putin has absolutely refused to comply with their wishes. And so if you look carefully, if you just look at the New York Times most recent article about the various so stations in Ukraine that the CIA has used to conduct terrorist operations and so forth, he knows those things. He found the uh, various laboratories that we'd established for all sorts of sick, perverse experimentation on supposedly people for the purpose of doing something to the Slavic race. I have no idea. I mean, I've heard all sorts of allegations. I'm prepared to believe almost anything now. But the bottom line is he's not going to comply. He, he has no interest in a war with us. He has no interest in a war no. with Europe. So he's going to avoid it because he, his assumption, I think, behind the scenes, that he will never say publicly, is if he just waits long enough, we'll collapse on our own. Now, when you go to the Middle East, that's a different kettle of fish. And increasingly, all the neocons, while they still want to try and keep the war going in Ukraine, you know, say, send F-16s, this new man, Budinov, is going to launch long-range missiles at Russia to try and provoke them. But the real focus now is on the Middle East. And everybody looked at this and thought, well, this is a righteous response to a horrible attack on the 7th of October. Then after about 50 days, everybody said, wait a minute, what is this? What are we really witnessing? And now we know what it is, it has very little to do with the 7th of October. And I think a lot of people are raising questions, and I think justifiably, that how did this 7th October thing really happen? There were Israeli officers, people in the intelligence community that reported on exactly what was happening inside Gaza. And for whatever reasons, they were told, no, you're wrong. So now we're beginning to wonder what happened on 7th October, and we're watching this mass expulsion and killing operation, and we're told that this too is justified. And Americans don't really know what's going on. I mean, you and I both know that. They look at it, they're a little bewildered, and remember, they too have been absolutely brainwashed and conditioned to accept the mass death of Arabs. After all, they're Muslim Arabs. They're our enemy. 
when you and I know that the vast majority of these people have no in interest whatsoever in harming us and are trying to survive one day to the next. But it doesn't matter. We're going to get a larger war in the region because the Israelis have had a lot of trouble in, uh, with Hamas. Hamas is not extinguished. It's not annihilated. They've turned north to Hezbollah, and their best bet at this point is to widen the war because we're there. And I, I, will, I will be very surprised if over the next few months we don't see U.S. strike packages from the naval power or ashore with the Air Force flying over various parts of the Middle East, destroying Israel's enemies. I think that's coming. And what everyone is missing is that for the first time, Islam is actually beginning to coalesce into an alliance. There, there, there is a feeling in the Islamic world that this is an existential war for them. Remember, Netanyahu said from the beginning, for us, this is existential. Well, he's now made it existential for Islam. And so it's really a Jewish war against the house of Islam. Now, I don't know how that comes out, but I have a great deal of difficulty thinking that Israel is going to survive this intact. I think Netanyahu may go down in history as the man that destroyed the place. But it's too soon to say, but I think there's a good chance that we're going to see very serious fighting that will involve Turks and ultimately Iranians as well as Arabs. And everybody says, oh, no, that's impossible. Well, I was told in January of 2022 when I said the Russians would go into Ukraine, oh, no, that's impossible. They'll never do that. That would be economically devastating for them. I'm hearing the same things about the Middle East. I think things have changed. The world has changed. And in, in the Middle East, everyone I know who travels there and visits with the elites and the ruling capitals all say the same thing. Everyone says, this is the end of Sykes-Picot. We will no longer tolerate this, but it's taking time. You know, it's sort of like washing glaciers finally move after thousands of years, but they'll move and they crush everything beneath them when they do. I, th I think we're headed in that direction. The question is, what do we do? Our country is in trouble here at home. And, and then you hear somebody say, well, it's all China's fault. And I tried to tell people, you know, the Chinese didn't open our borders. The Chinese are, didn't open our ports. Yeah. Now, Maybe the fentanyl comes there, but it goes to Mexico and we let it in. And 110,000 people a year roughly are dying from it and no one seems terribly concerned. There's something wrong with this picture. How much money does do the cartels have that they can use for influence inside our government? I don't know, but I suspect there's a lot of money out there. Uh, you know, I, I just want to go back to the, the Israel what, again. They're going to keep expanding it. There's no question about it. And uh, I mean, they're bombing bombs away over Lebanon now. They're hitting eastern Lebanon. And people don't, oh, the Hezbollah, they're, they're terrorists, militants. Oh, you mean the Hezbollah that drove Israel out of Lebanon? Why, how dare they do that, those militants? And I believe they're going to expand this. And that's what I'm saying. World War III is going to become official when there's a major event that happens. You go back to World War II, I tell people, Google up, uh, FDR put sanctions on Japan. And what he did, again, history today, mainstream, in, when did they bomb Pearl Harbor in December? In July of 1941, a couple of months earlier, FDR seized all Japanese assets in America. The United States, the UK, and the Dutch put sanctions on Japan that cut off three quarters of their global trade and 88% of their imported oil. They only import 100%. You know why? Those dirty Japs, they invaded French Indochina. Wait a minute. First of all, I'm an American. What do I care about that? And what are you talking about this French Indochina? You mean the French in, in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos stealing tin, rubber, and rape and pillage? That What I'm saying is that when all else fails, that remember, this is the Great Depression, they take you to war. Can't but, understand why Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, how, how dare they? Well, there was something else that, that FDR did, and this really upset both the leadership of the United States Navy and Army at the time, and that was that he insisted that the fleet the Pacific fleet that normally after 
exercises returned to their you know home ports on the western coast he said no keep the fleet at pearl harbor in hawaii well immediately the chief of naval operations contacted the, the president and said this is very dangerous we could lose the fleet you know we don't know what will happen i mean they'd been practicing for years to deal with a japanese attack but they also knew there wasn't much they could do they knew they couldn't rescue our soldiers who were on uh, you know, Manila in the Philippines, couldn't do it. That's how we had 12,000 men fall into the hands of the Japanese in 1942. And at the same time, General uh, Marshall sat down with the uh, CNO and said, we've got to start planning because it's very hard to foresee a way out of this without a war. And you know the rest of the story. There were attempts by the Japanese right up until November to come to a, a conclusion, the last one, of course, uh, gave Roosevelt virtually everything he wanted. But thanks to Harry Dexter White, who was an NKVD agent working for Henry Morgenthau, uh, FDR was persuaded not to do that because ultimately the, the principal beneficiary from a war between the United States and Japan was Stalin. So I think we're, we're dealing with potential Pearl Harbors now. We've yep. got Pearl Harbors all over the place, all over the Middle East, and we still have them on the edge of the war zone in Europe. And if this thing gets out of control in any of those areas, then you could have really devastating attacks against which we have very little to, to utilize. I mean, what do we got? Our armed forces are in ruins. I, people, if you, look at, if you look at Ukraine as an example of war today, we, we already lost the entire US Army plus over there in a real war. And yet we continue to threaten people. And of course, this also raises the specter of a nuclear exchange. Yep. And everybody tells me that, you know, although that's not going to happen. Well, I hope and pray that it doesn't. But let's not put ourselves in the position of failing and losing, whether it's in the Middle East or somewhere else and having to resort to something like that. So. Yeah. Again, I believe World War Three's begun and it's just going to become official when there's like a Pearl Harbor or something. Look what happened when they killed three Americans on the Jordanian uh, Syrian border. Again, which we have no right being in all these countries. Oh, all of a sudden, Americans bombs away over Syria and Iraq. Three killed. Well, how many Palestinians got killed yesterday? Oh, according to the UN, it's around over about 215 a day. But well, three Americans, and I'm saying there's going to be a full you know, flag of Those three Americans were reservists. Yeah. Really didn't know what the hell they were doing anyway. They were over there doing something because the army itself is too small. Uh, it's been too small for a long time. And everyone's upset over the loss of these three American lives, as you point out. But the question I asked at the time was, do we go to war over the loss of three American That's soldiers on foreign soil? And people said, well, we can't let this go. I said, wait a minute. You know, do you want to go to war? And of course, we're not prepared for a major war, Gerald, no. we are not. You know, they asked uh, a guy who knew a thing or two about the atom bomb, Einstein, you know, what kind of weapons will be used to fight the Third World War? He said, I don't know, but they'll be using sticks and stones to fight the fourth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. He was right. D Douglas, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, really, where, where can people find out more about what you're what we're well, I've uh, become part of a new organization called Our Country, Our Choice. You can find it at ourcountryourchoice.com. And you can see what we're about. We're trying very hard to unite uh, Republicans and Democrats and others across party lines. Our view, and, and this is one of the things that members tell me all the time, we're, up, we're closing in on a quarter of a million members. We've only been around for five months. Wow. And uh, several of them say, you know, we vote for the Democrats. We vote for the Republicans. We vote for various people. And we get the same outcome, election no after election. Nothing changes. And so these are the people that are joining. But I tell them it's not just we're, – we're not just uniting across party lines on specific issues. I mean, we are. But we want to do something. And one of the things that we've got to do is recruit people to go in and occupy, occupy – the federal bureaucracy to fill the appointed and elected slots. And we've got to stop retreads from going back in. And that's what's happened over and over and over again. And that's my great fear, regardless of who ever is victorious in November, that we'll end up with more retreads and no change. And that could be disastrous in, in the worst imaginable way, as you know.
That's terrific what you're doing. That's great. Now, where is it again? How could they go there? Just ourcountryourchoice.com. Just plug it in to your search engine. It'll take you to the website. Look at what we're doing. See what we're doing. See the presentations we made. And we're trying to build up a huge force of people across the country that are very networked. We have various concentrations we're trying to solidify at this point. We want to get millions involved because when the larger you are, the more impact, the greater the weight you have. People pay, begin to pay attention. I talked to a group the other day and I said, and you'll remember this, Gerald. Obama decided he was going to bomb Syria. Do you remember that? I remember. And he, he was all set and prepared to do it. Everyone in Washington was celebrating, oh, we can't wait to bomb Syria because this is another larger expansion and this will mean more money for all the wrong people and great power for us. Didn't work. It didn't work because people called in tens of thousands. The phones rang off the hooks. Email was clogged. You know, people said, no, we don't want this to happen. And so Obama walked out, and instead of announcing it, he said, we're not going to do it, turned around and walked away. And I keep telling them, you can scare these people. Oh, these yeah. are not courageous people. You got it. You know, they are not courageous, and they're afraid, but you've got to demonstrate that you're serious. And you tell these people, I will never vote for you again. Yep. It doesn't matter how much money you spend. That gets people's attention. I agree 100%. You know, as I one of the Bronx things... You call these guys out man to man, they don't know whether they're a piss or shit. Yep. They're I cowards. They remind, me, they remind me of the kids that you know used to take out uh, at recess and beat the crap out of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, these are little cowards, little Chucky Schumers, little Lindsey Grahams, dead in your face, Mitch McConnell, these clowns telling us what to do. How dumb could you be? Uh, uh, Douglas, thank you so much for being here. Everybody, really see all the interviews that he does with Judge Andrew Napolitano and others. He's brilliant. He's brilliant when it comes to these facts about what in the world is going on in the geopolitical edge and and what we can do to change it. This guy knows the history. He's been there. He's done it. And he's given you information that you're not getting anywhere else. Douglas, thank you so much. It's, I'm really, really. Uh, honored that you're on and thank you all for what you're doing. Well, thanks, Joe. I look forward to seeing you again.